What up, YouTube? Here with another episode of Talk Boxing. On this episode, I'll be giving y'all the latest that's been happening in the sport of boxing. I know I haven't been up to date with providing this channel with the latest that's been coming out from the sport of boxing as far as giving y'all my previews and post-fight thoughts with all the fights that's been happening in the sport and I just haven't had the time to make videos throughout my schedule with all that that's been happening hence why I came up with the content this podcast like of a series called talk boxing because of situations like these where I haven't been providing this channel with up-to-date content and that's why I could talk about more than just one subject in a video and it's not like you're regular preview or post fight video pertaining to one specific fight or one specific news and as I said it's been a lot that's been going on with boxing these past few months this whole year has been a very busy and very active year for the sport of boxing and it's been a good year as well for the sport of boxing. And anyways, before I get off track, y'all can read by the titles as far as what fights I'll be giving y'all my thoughts on. The first fight I'll be giving y'all my review on is the fight that we saw, the rematch with Zeng Lei Zeng and Joe Joyce. And this fight went exactly how I expected it to go. It was much like the first fight, except that in the rematch, that it ended quicker and more emphatic than the first fight. If y'all remember the first fight, Zay Lei Singh was dominant. It was a one-sided fight on the favor, on the half of Zay Lei Zhang, and his left hand, his straight left was working like a charm and was the key factor to Zhang's victory against Joe Joyce in their first fight. It was because the straight left that was landing at will, that's what produced the welt that shut the right eye of Joe Joyce. And that was the main factor to why the fight ended the way it did. In the sixth round, the referee listened to the advice, the suggestion of the doctor that was at ringside that was called to check on the right eye of Joe Joyce that was completely shut and that swelling was getting bad. And that's why the referee called for the doctor to step up. And when the doctor checked on the eye of Joe Joyce, he suggested to the referee to stop the bout and the referee did just that, and he called a halt to the bout, and there was no complaints on the side of Joe Joyce. And as a spectator that was watching the fight, I definitely didn't disagree with the referee's choice to end the bout. And if it would have continued any longer, I'm quite sure either Joe Joyce, if he wouldn't have quit on the stool or took a knee, his corner could have threw in the towel to suggest to end the bout or it would have ended like the second fight that we saw with Zhang and Joyce. And leading up to this fight, I didn't see Joe Joyce working on anything particular to make adjustments to come out victorious in the rematch versus Zhang. 
And I couldn't see him making any crazy fundamental changes and the necessary adaptives for him to get the victory versus Zane in the rematch. And that's exactly what we saw in the rematch. And Joe Joyce, his stiffness, his lack of movement, especially when it comes to head movement and keeping his head off the center line was detrimental for his loss versus Zayle Zang in the rematch as well. The same flaws that helped him not get the win versus Zang in the first fight was the same reason why he lost the second fight because prior to the knockout and the second fight ended earlier than the first fight. The first fight, as I said, ended via TKO in the sixth round. The rematch ended via knockout in the third round. And this time... The knockout happened after a devastating blow from a short right hook from Zayle Zhang that caught Joe Joyce ducking with his head down and it was in close gap circumference when Zayle Zhang landed that flush, swift, strong, devastating right hook on Joe Joyce that floored Joe Joyce and it was definitely a highlight reel knockout. Joe Joyce did get his conscience back. However, he wasn't able to answer the referee's 10 count and when he got back up on his feet, he didn't look like he had his balance and footing under him. That's why the referee said, you know what, the bell ain't going to save him and he's in no shape to continue fighting. He was out on his feet when he got back up and the referee could see that. That's why the referee didn't say, hey, he officially answered the 10 count when he got back up on his feet. And Zhang knew once he dropped Joe Joyce with that right hook of his, that he was done for and that's why he walked away celebrating before Joyce got back up on his feet because he knew that shot was it and Joe Joyce now he's got to go back to the drawing board he has a lot of fundamentals and adjustments to make to climb back up amongst the top of the heavyweights ranking. And as far as Zayle Zane goes, this is yet another emphatic victory for Zayle Zane and definitely a statement maker. And this definitely catapults and elevates Zane to the next level as he retained his WBO interim heavyweight title. The current WBO heavyweight champion is Alexander Usyk. He had a victory over on Daniel Dubois in his last fight back in August. It wasn't Usyk's best performance. However, he did enough to secure the victory versus Dubois. And at the end of this year, he's going to fight Tyson Fury in a undisputed heavyweight title fight showdown and that's the fight that all boxing fans and sports fans and the public wants to see produced out of the sport of boxing and that's definitely well i'm gonna talk about that subject later on after i give y'all all the post fight thoughts and reviews on the fights that I will be covering on this episode of Talk Boxing because as y'all can read by the title and in the description that 
the Usyk Fury fight and it being made official is going to be a subject that I will be talking about on this episode of Talk Boxing. Anyways, now Zhang is definitely a top contender now and is a strong candidate to be next to fight the undisputed heavyweight champion possibly the winner of the Fury Usyk fight possibly next year we could see Zayle Zhang take on the winner of that undisputed heavyweight title fight and this knockout can be considered as one of the best knockout of the year for 2023 and Zayle Zhang his only defeat on his professional record is versus Flip Hagarov. Now I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly However, that is besides the point that I'm making. That fight ended in a split decision. And that goes to show you it was a close fight. Hagarov, I thought, won the fight. It was competitive. It was very close. I could see how many people could have scored it for Zhang. And... Hagorov is a decorated amateur fighter and as well as a high-ranked contender amongst the heavyweights. And he is the number one ranked contender ranked by the IBF. And he is also a contender that is considered to be next in line to challenge either Alexander Usyk, the current IBF heavyweight champion, or next year, he could fight the winner of the undisputed heavyweight title fight between Tyson Fury and Alexander Usyk next year. And Flip Hagorov is rumored to have a possible fight Sometime next year versus Anthony Joshua, who's been a household name in not only heavyweight boxing, however, in all of sport of boxing, he has been considered being amongst the top of the faces and one of the biggest draws in the sport of boxing for quite some time now. And Hagorov versus Joshua has been a rumor fight that could potentially be made sometime next year. And as I said, Zayle Zhang, if he doesn't get a heavyweight title fight for his next immediate fight, there's still marketable matches out there for Zayle Zhang. Deontay Wilder isn't doing anything right now. He hasn't fought in over a year. He isn't scheduled to fight for the rest of the year. And I don't know when we're going to see Deontay Wilder fight. It's been rumored that Deontay Wilder could have a mega fight versus former heavyweight champion who is promoted by the same promoter and that being Andy Ruiz and that would be a mega American heavyweight fight with two American former heavyweight champions and he could fight either Ruiz or Deontay Wilder if he doesn't get an immediate title shot next and Ruiz and Wilder can't seem to come to terms much like how Ruiz and Joshua or Joshua and Wilder couldn't come to terms 
as far as the money goes for those fights to happen. Zhang would be a dangerous fight for any heavyweight fighter with a name and reputation to uphold. And right now with the momentum and the role that Zhang has got right now, he is a dangerous fighter for any top contender or champion to take on. That's why I think Zhang should be next in line. Either Zhang or Hagarov should be next in line to challenge the winner of the Usyk Fury fight. And they should get that fight next year for the undisputed heavyweight title. And the next fight I'll be giving y'all my post-fight thoughts on was for the IBF featherweight title. The bout between Luis Alberto Lopez and Yoel Gonzalez. And this fight ended in a unanimous decision. I had the fight scored 117 and 111 in favor of the champion, Luis Alberto Lopez. And after defeating Josh Warrington for the IBF featherweight title in Warrington's hometown, he defeated... Michael Conlan and what was one of the best knockouts that we saw what was it was it um I think it was earlier this year that this fight happened between Lopez and Conlan so it's still considered to be was it yeah I think I think it was earlier this year I don't know what month and what exact date that the fight happened at However, it still is definitely considered to be a strong candidate to be the knockout of the year for this year. And after defeating both Warrington and Conlan in their respective hometowns, he had a title defense that was fought on neutral grounds versus Yoel Gonzalez. And this was yet another great performance we saw out of the current IBF featherweight champion Luis Alberto Lopez and he showed good fundamentals and he showed how technically sound he is and how he's durable we saw how durable he is from the Warrington fight and that he has a chin from the Conlan fight and in this fight he showed improvements when it comes to his defense his movement and his ability to control distance and the pace and his tempo and his energy in this fight versus Gonzalez now what I was most impressed with when it comes to the defense of Luis Alberto Lopez was his ability to roll with the punches to take less damage from his opponent's shots. Because Joet Gonzalez, whenever he would come at Lopez with his aggression, Lopez, when he would encounter and stop Gonzalez at his tracks with his counter combination of punches, he would just either roll with the shots that was thrown at him, or he would have his guard on high to block all the punches that was coming from Gonzalez. And when Gonzalez closed the gap, to have the fight being fought at a much closer range than Lopez would have liked to prefer the fight to be fought at. He would know when to clinch and when to make it uncomfortable for Gonzalez, for Gonzalez's work to be ineffective. And Luis Alberto Lopez, he knows when to time his shots and when to fluctuate his shots and to level change his shots to keep Gonzalez 
at bay and to keep Gonzalez guessing to have him not be able to throw his shots. And I thought that was a show of in-ring brilliance on the part of Luis Alberto Lopez. And this definitely puts Luis Alberto Lopez as a top featherweight champion. And I say that because we've seen Robesi Ramirez have a good performance in his first title defense on the undercard to in a way in Fulton where he scored that TKO win in his first defense and a successful first defense of his WBO featherweight title. However, he hasn't held the title as long as Lopez has and he hasn't fought the level of competition that Lopez has. And Wood is the current WBA featherweight champion and he had just recently won the WBA featherweight title and he hasn't had as many dominant performances and as much impressive performances as Luis Alberto Lopez. Then there's the current WBC featherweight champion Ray Vargas who was considered to be the top featherweight in the world he in his last fight fought as super featherweight when he challenged foster for foster's super featherweight title that fight didn't go the way how vargas wanted it to and vargas hasn't fought since then and that was earlier this year i think he should fight the winner of the rematch that's been rumored to happen with Mark McSayo and Brendan Figueroa. Remember, they had a close competitive bout. If that rematch doesn't happen, I think Ray Vargas should put his WBC featherweight title on the line versus Brendan Figueroa next, who defeated Mark McSayo in his featherweight debut. And I think that's the best fight for Ray Vargas to have next in his comeback to the featherweight division. And if he gets a victory versus a high-level fighter like Brandon Figueroa, then Ray Vargas can be considered to be the best featherweight fighter. Until then, I would say Luis Alberto Lopez has a crown as the current best featherweight fighter especially after this performance versus Yoet Gonzalez that we saw in Luis Alberto Lopez's last fight. And Luis Alberto Lopez, I think in his next fight, he should keep on stepping up in level of competition as the best featherweight fighter in the world right now. That's from my perspective. And I don't know what boxing outlets rankings are looking like as far as their particular rankings go when it comes to the featherweight division. I think Ring Magazine still has Ray Vargas as the number one featherweight. However, as I said, on my rankings when it comes to the featherweight division, the number one fighter at featherweight is Luis Alberto Lopez. I think after defeating Michael Conlan the way he did in Conlan's hometown and defeating Josh Warrington in that competitive close bout at Warrington's hometown when he first initially won the IBF featherweight title, those two fights were a heck of a test, a great battle for Luis Alberto Lopez to become and earn the IBF featherweight title, and I thought that fight versus Yoel Gonzalez, and this is no shade towards Yoel Gonzalez because Yoel Gonzalez, to many boxing outlets and medias, 
Yoel Gonzalez is considered to be amongst the top 10 to top 15 featherweight contenders in featherweight boxing. However, as I said, I thought him not going on the road, I'm talking about Luis Alberto Lopez, and not having to fight a top-level contender that is either top 5 or top 10 in the featherweight division in their hometown was a break for Luis Alberto Lopez from the prior two fights that he had before defending his IBF featherweight title against Yoel Gonzalez in neutral grounds. And I think a fight versus Mauricio Lara, that would be a fan-friendly fight stylistically speaking. He could go for a title unification bout versus Lee Wood. That would be a good fight as well. And I'm sure a fighter, a champion like Luis Alberto Lopez definitely wouldn't mind going overseas to the UK to have another mega fight, especially out there in England where they show so much support for their local fighters and they value title fights a lot more than in the United States of America. And Luis Alberto Lopez is a Mexican fighter and Mexico, they show support for their local scenes a lot more than the U.S., much like how they do over there in the U.K. That's why I say Luis Alberto Lopez, marketably and promotionally speaking, I'm sure him and his team wouldn't mind having another big title fight out there in the UK where he's had much success at, at derailing the British boxing fans and their local fighters and champions' hopes of having that big moment. Anyways, I'm going to continue speaking on featherweight boxing because the next subject I'm going to be giving y'all my thoughts on was the fight between Lee Wood and Josh Warrington. Now this fight was a thriller of a fight and it was a compelling bout. I say that because of how this fight ended. And this fight ended in a 7th round knockout win for Lee Wood. He successfully defend, defended his WBA featherweight title versus Josh Warrington, former champion. And this fight, it was Josh Warrington's fight prior to the knockout. The only round I had scored in favor of Lee Wood was the first round. The rest of the fight from round two all the way to round six, I had it scored for Josh Warrington. It was one-sided. Lee Wood, his tactics wasn't working. Josh Warrington's pressure and his aggression and his relentlessness was overwhelming Lee Wood's and it was throwing Lee Wood off of his game. And so much to the point where Lee Wood, who was fighting from a southpaw stance because Lee Wood can fight from either stance, whether orthodox or southpaw, he decided to fight from a southpaw stance to confuse and to throw Josh Warrington off and that wasn't working because Josh Warrington was getting past the jab 
of Lee Wood, and that wasn't allowing Lee Woods to work behind a jab of his. And Josh Warrington, his level changing, his combinations, and his work rate, and his body shots, and that left hook was landing flush on Lee Wood. And Lee Wood, he tends to have a problem where he has his head and chin wide open to be a target for his opponent to hit. That's how he got caught versus Mauricio Lara in their first fight and what was considered to be one of the best knockouts of last year because when he throws his punches, he leaves himself open to be countered and whenever he would throw out a jab in hopes to stop Josh Warrington at his tracks, he would leave himself available for Josh Warrington to land his shots and it was landing. And it was effective because the marks was being left on Lee Woods and it was the seventh round where Lee Woods would turn it around on Josh Warrington. And there was a point deducted by the referee because Josh Warrington kept on hitting the back of Lee Wood Lee Wood's head. And Lee Wood, he was complaining to the referee earlier on about his head being held down and his head the back of his head getting hit whenever they were in close range. The referee didn't say much about it. Hence why when I was watching the fight, I did not understand the referee's choice and his decision to deduct a point from Josh Warrington with the lack of warnings because when that was going on and when Lee Wood would throw out his complaints, the referee, from the looks of it, wasn't hearing none of Lee Woods complaints that's why I was surprised and was at a disagreement with the referee's decision to deduct a point with the lack of warning and Josh Warrington showed signs of desperation he turned up the volume with his aggression and his pressure and his work rate however Lee Wood would maintain his composure and that helped him his maintaining of his composure and his ability to telegraph the shots and the attacks of Josh Warrington and him keeping his steadiness and his calmness is what helped him have his in-ring intelligence for him to uh, for him to land his shots at flush and be accurate with his shots and be calculated and effective with his shots to neutralize the aggression and pressure of Josh Warrington that was overwhelming him and that was swarming him throughout the earlier rounds prior to the seventh round. And I think Josh Warrington overstepping on the gas pedal is what helped Lee Wood get back in tune with the pace of this fight. And Lee Wood, towards the end of the seventh round, would land a combination of punches that would land flush on Josh Warrington and that would floor Josh Warrington and Josh Warrington when he got back up on his feet he made it back to his corner without looking at the referee that's how you knew that Josh Warrington wasn't in the shape to continue fighting he didn't want to look at the referee because he was there however nobody was home and if the referee would have looked into Josh Warrington's eyes, I'm sure the referee 
could have read that and Josh Warrington didn't have his footing under him and he wasn't conscious regardless of the fact that through his muscles and through that fighter instance is what got him back up on his feet. However, as I said, the way he reacted to that knockdown, he wasn't in the condition to continue fighting. And I don't know if those 90 seconds would have helped Josh Warrington gain back his conscience fully for him to get ready for the eighth round. However, I thought the referee made the right decision to call a halt to the bout when Josh Warrington turned away from the referee to go back to his corner to either sit on the stool again. And the way he looked at it, he tried to play it off like he's going to his cornerman to get him the stool and to play off the fact that the round has ended. And hopefully speaking for Josh Warrington's side that the bell could save him. However, as I said, he was out on his feet. And that was a comeback for the ages of a performance on the part of Lee Wood and a successful first title defense of the WBA featherweight title for the WBA featherweight champion, Lee Wood. And Lee Wood showed his durability and his ability to endure and his ability to take accumulation of punishment and punches and shots from a volume puncher, a aggressive fighter, a experienced veteran former champion like Josh Warrington and Lee Wood, he is improving and he is definitely stepping up to the ladder of being considered a top, he already is a top level featherweight champion. However, he definitely is showing the attributes of being a being in the midst of the best featherweight fighter in the featherweight division right now. And as I said, I would have Lee Wood considered to be at number three when it comes to the featherweight division ranking right after Luis Alberto Lopez and Ray Vargas. And if he would have had more of a dominant, one-sided performance in his fight versus Josh Warrington, then he could be considered either number two or one because he had a decisive victory in the rematch versus Marusio Lara. And that was where he picked up from where he left off at from their first fight because if y'all remember in the first fight with Wood and Laura, Wood was doing a good job at outboxing Laura until he made that fundamental technical mistake of leaving himself open for a counter shot when he throws his shots. And that's what got him knocked out in the first fight versus Laura. And then in the second fight, he made the right adjustments to not make those same mistakes and fought a brilliant technical fight in the rematch versus Laura. And I think Lee Wood should fight a top level fighter for his next fight definitely with the role that he's been on and he 
can definitely draw out there locally in England with the support that the British boxing fans show for the sport of boxing. And he definitely does deserve a break from fighting either former champions, top contenders. And I know it sounds cliche and not right to many boxing fans, especially when it comes to boxing critics and long-time educated boxing fans, because it's like saying a champion not having championship material fights doesn't make any sense. However, what I'm trying to say is Lee Wood can fight a fighter that is not on the level of a Mauricio Lara, Josh Warrington, Luis Alberto Lopez, Ray Vargas, Mark McSayo, Brandon Figueroa, names like that. If he doesn't fight a fighter of that caliber, it wouldn't hurt his resume or his legacy or his momentum right now. And I say for Josh Warrington, he has unfinished business versus Mauricio Lara. If y'all remember, it was a year or two ago when they had their rematch and that ended in a no contest due to a accidental headbutt that forced the fight to be ended and they haven't had a trilogy bout after that controversial second fight. And the first fight, Mauricio Lara won via knockout versus Josh Warrington. And I think Mauricio Lara also deserves a trilogy bout versus Lee Wood. I know it doesn't sound as compelling as a possible third fight that we could see next for Josh Warrington and for Mauricio Lara because Lee Wood picked up from where he left off at in the first fight and he made the right changes and the right adjustments to get the victory over on Mauricio Lara in their second fight to win the WBA featherweight title from Lara and that's why a third fight between those two isn't as compelling and as much of a good sounding match as a third fight with Laura and Warrington and whoever wins that fight can fight Lee Wood for the WBA featherweight title in a rematch. I think Josh Warrington is more deserving of it than Mauricio Laura because of Josh Warrington being up on the scorecards before getting knocked out. And he could look to avenge that loss versus Lee Wood in a rematch and hopefully pick up from where he left off at prior to being stopped. And those are my post-fight thoughts when it comes to that fight. And the next fight that I'll be giving y'all my post-fight thoughts on was the fight between Zerto Ramirez and Joe Smith Jr. This fight was a one-sided fight. It was a debut fight for both fighters at a new weight class at Cruiserweight. And they both look like they are more comfortable fighting at cruiserweight than at light heavyweight because they don't have to drain as much weight like when they was fighting at light heavyweight and Zerto Ramirez is a former super middleweight champion his last fight w was versus Dimitri Bivol where he took a L versus Dimitri Bivol when he tried to capture the WBA light heavyweight title and that was almost a year ago when that fight happened. And this was Zerto's bounce back fight. And 
it was the same for Joe Smith Jr. He was looking to bounce back from his loss versus Arthur Bedebiev. And that was for a title unification bout in the light heavyweight division. Zerto didn't get knocked out like Joe Smith did. And with both fighters trying to avenge the L that they took in their last fight and having a common opponent in Dmitry Bovall, who they both lost to, and they have been around for quite a while now, both Joe Smith and Zerto Ramirez, and that's what makes them a known name amongst boxing fans and that's why this fight was a good fight for both fighters and a fresh new start for both fighters and at a new weight class as well and this was a one-sided fight in favor of Zerto Ramirez and this was a WBA cruiserweight title eliminator and Zerto Ramirez he can capitalize off of this win because this could have been scored a shutout. I had this fight scored a shutout. Zerto Ramirez, he showed technical and fundamental brilliance. His one tool was working like a charm for him. He was able to stop Joe Smith at his tracks, out punching the puncher, his level changing, and his ability to work from different angles and his ability to read the distance and keeping Joe Smith at a distance where he wanted Joe Smith to be at and taking the puncher's punches away was a brilliant tactic, a brilliant fight plan for Zerto Ramirez and it was executed very well and it was an impressive cruiserweight debut for Zerto Ramirez. Now, as for Joe Smith Jr., it was noted by the commentary team of the zone that both fighters shared to the zone's commentary team that they didn't have any interest in stepping back down the light heavyweight and looks to continue competing at cruiserweight now is Joe Smith Jr. He is recognized by the boxing fans. However, he isn't a big draw. Now, does that mean Joe Smith Jr. is going to be a traveling journeyman gatekeeper of a fighter at cruiserweight that's going to look to accumulate wins and look to bounce back from a back-to-back -back loss versus top-level fighters. Arthur Bedebiev is undefeated, has all his wins via knockout. It was a title unification bout. And he fought Zerto Ramirez, who's a veteran, former champion as well. And is a top level fighter was that a super middleweight as he was that at light heavyweight and Zerto Ramirez looks to be considered a top level fighter at cruiserweight as well now not making any excuses however Joe Smith Jr. does have the factor that he took on the best competition and regardless of his effort, those two guys, Arthur Bedebiev and Zerto Ramirez, were the better fighters when he fought against them. And his other defeat that came from Dmitry Bovol, who was also undefeated and is a champion and is considered to be a top 10 pound for pound best fighter in the world, Joe Smith Jr. can still be considered a legitimate contender at cruiserweight especially if he can rack up some victories versus notable fighters and 
and fighters that's been fighting amongst the top level contenders at cruiserweight for quite a while and then he could maybe possibly line himself up for a title shot and avenge the L's that he took in his last two fights. And as for Zerdo Ramirez, as I said, this was a good performance and a good comeback fight for Zerdo Ramirez. And now he elevates and catapults himself to be ranked as a top contender by the WBA and the current WBA Cruiserweight Champion is the current WBA Cruiserweight Champion name is Arsen Goulamirian. He is a Armenian fighter based out of France, undefeated, 27-0 and 0 with 18 knockouts and he's had all his fights in France and him fighting at Cruiserweight and being a champion at Cruiserweight and being a local fighter that's never fought outside of France doesn't make him a recognizable name, not only to the public, however, I would say amongst majority of boxing fans, you have to be a real live dedicated boxing fan to know this guy. And the, and the cruiserweight division is a slept on division that not a lot of fans pay any attention to and that's a current WBA Cruiserweight Champion and this fight was a WBA Cruiserweight title eliminator so that makes Zerto Ramirez next in line to challenge Arsene Goulamirium for the WBA Cruiserweight title and then there is the current number one ranked WBA cruiserweight contender, a Cuban fighter who's been fighting at cruiserweight for quite some time now. And he's not that recognizable either. He already has two defeats on his record. And his name is Uriel Doritikos. And I say he's not that recognizable amongst majority of sports fans. And if you are a longtime avid boxing fan, then y'all would remember him from the World Boxing Super Series tournament. He fought Miramis Berettis for the IBF Cruiserweight title and the Ring Magazine Cruiserweight title. He's a former Cruiserweight champion as well. And he would be a good test for a potential next fight versus Zerto Ramirez as Zerto Ramirez gets himself prepped to step up in the level of competition in this new weight class that he decided to step up and fight at in the cruiserweight division. That Now, that would be a good fight for him. That's the current number one ranked WBA contender. And as I said, the cruiserweight division, ever since the tournament that we saw where Alexander Usyk won and became the undisputed cruiserweight champion after winning that tournament, Attention has left the cruiserweight division for a while now. Ever since then, it has been a slept on division. And it's, it's like the lighter weight classes, like the fly weights and on under, like the bantam weights. The bantam weights, they get a little shine here and there. But I say it's like the flyweights or the local non PBC and ESPN undercar fights that we don't get to see competed in the lighter weight classes that's being fought more locally out there in Asia or Latin America. And 
that's what the cruiserweight division has been like forever, I would say. And Lawrence O'Coley has been the biggest draw in the cruiserweight division ever since Alexander Usyk stepped up to the heavyweight division and he lost his last fight and that was an upset and Bredis who gave Alexander Usyk a heck of a fight in the final of the cruiserweight tournament he lost to Jai Opatai for the lineal and IBF cruiserweight title and Opatai ever since that victory over on Bredis has been ranked as the number one best cruiserweight in boxing and that's the current IBF and lineal unified cruiserweight champion then there's Badu Jack who in his last fight defeated Makabu and became the WBC cruiserweight champion he earned himself a reputation from when he was fighting at light heavyweight and at super middleweight being a former champion at super middleweight I think before becoming the new WBC cruiserweight champion when he won his last fight versus Makabu and that would be the most marketable fight that Zerto Ramirez can have next at least in America and if he wants to challenge for the WBO or the IBF cruiserweight title which is held by the IBF cruiserweight title is held by Jai Opata as I have mentioned before the WBO cruiserweight title is held by Chris Billiam Smith who defeated Lawrence O'Coley in a upset victory earlier this year and he fights in England and Zerto being a fighter that fights under Golden Boy and the Zone and Chris Billiam Smith he was supposed to lose to Lawrence O'Coley according to majority of boxing fans and if you're a promoter who is trying to market the next big fighter to be elevated to the next level of being that guy that draws in Lawrence O'Coley and Chris Billiam Smith getting that victory over on Lawrence O'Coley definitely elevated him and his reputation amongst boxing fans especially out there in England and Lawrence O'Coley he is he promoted by I think he's either co-promoted by Frank Warren and Eddie Hearns because I know Lawrence O'Coley fights on the zone and regardless of Bo Zerto and O'Coley and Chris Billiam Smith let's mention Chris Billiam Smith because that's the current champion not Lawrence O'Coley we're not talking about marketable fighters and we're not speaking from a promotional point of view we are talking about sheer boxing and it's competition and Chris Billiam Smith is the champion not Lawrence O'Coley now I don't know who Smith is promoted by I don't know what network he fights for as I said he was the underdog in that fight and he was supposed to lose and Lawrence O'Coley was supposed to keep on steamrolling with the momentum that he had going on however as I said and 
That's why I think Smith versus Ramirez can be a fight that could be made as well. And with Smith coming off of this win versus O'Coley and him being what I would say is a free agent because I don't know who he's promoted by or what network he's signed to and his last fight being on the zone and I think that's why that fight could be a easily made fight and I'm sure because Zerto Ramirez has fought outside of the U.S., he wouldn't mind fighting overseas. And I'm sure Chris William Smith, who just recently got recognition by pulling off that upset, wouldn't mind coming over to the U.S. to have yet another marketable fight versus yet another no name like Zerto Ramirez. And Zerto Ramirez can fight. And if he does get a title shot for the WBA title versus Arsene Gouli and Miriam, the French fighter, Armenian slash French fighter, who has never fought outside of France, and I'm quite sure he fights and works with a French boxing promotion and fights on a French network. And I don't know what sports network he has his fights broadcasted on and what promotion he's promoted by. And I don't know what Golden Boy and The Zone has to do to make that fight happen. And I don't know how easy the terms will be for the fight to happen for the WBA title if Zerto Ramirez does in fact get a WBA Cruiserweight title shot versus Gouli and Miriam possibly for his next fight if not then he could as I said another fight that would be a good look for Zerto Ramirez would be versus the guy at Kuzaway, Jai Opata, who fights based out of Australia. And I don't know what promotion he works with. I don't know what network he has his fights aired on. And how easy that fight would be to make, promotionally speaking. And... As I said, if he does fight the next best ranked contender ranked by the WBA, who I mentioned earlier, Uriel Doritikos, and a fight like that, a non-title fight, would be a much easier fight to make than a title fight. And it makes more sense for a fight like that to happen for Zerto Ramirez next than a title fight. Anyways, those are my post-fight thoughts for the Zerto Ramirez and Joe Smith Jr. fight. Moving on to the next and last subject is the fight being officially signed. And that's the heavyweight fight that the public has been requesting and that is the first undisputed heavyweight title fight in the modern era it's supposed to happen at the end of this year it's rumored to be on the 23rd of december and it's got a hosting city it's not going to be in england it's not going to be in the u.s it's not going to be in Europe, it's going to be in Saudi Arabia. And it makes sense because with Saudi Arabia hosting it, I'm sure that Saudi money spoke to both fighters and the promoters and both camps. That's why 
this fight is being hosted in Saudi Arabia and not anywhere else. And Tyson Fury, he got an exhibition bout coming up next week versus Francis Ngannou. And that's why it all lines up how this fight with Fury and Usyk is going to be in Saudi Arabia at the end of this year. And as a boxing fan, I'm looking forward to it. I'm sure it's going to be talked about a lot by sports media, sports fans, and the public. And this is the fight that makes boxing compelling and it's fights like like these like a Gervonta Davis versus Ryan Garcia young and up and coming fighters who are in their prime might not be champions yet however guaranteed future champions and Gervonta Davis was already a former champion at featherweight and at super featherweight and there is Fury and Usyk now. This fight reminds me a lot of the Terrence Crawford, Errol Spence fight that we saw. Both fighters who are well seasoned, who have enough experience, are considered veterans, top pound for pound fighters, has been that for a long time. And it was for the undisputed titles at welterweight, two of the best at the same division fighting for all the titles and we're getting the same at the end of this year to close what's been a very successful a very entertaining calendar of a year for the sport of boxing with this fight and there's no way better to close out the year that was so good for the sport than a fight of this magnitude that we're getting with Fury and Usyk and as far as the terms go I don't know what the numbers is I'm quite sure that the numbers are lucrative and that's why it's happening and I think there is a rematch clause if both fighters depending on whoever loses this fight wants to push that rematch clause that was negotiated in the contract to have this fight happen. And as I say, I'm looking forward to it. And I'm gonna say my predictions for the preview video whenever I do give y'all that. And both Fury and Usyk has been running out of opponents to defend their titles against. They have pretty much fought everyone else that they can fight at heavyweight to defend their titles against. Usyk hasn't fought as much top-level heavyweight competition as Fury because he hasn't fought at heavyweight for all his career like Fury has. And Usyk... He's only had three title fights and in his debut fight where he got that TKO win in his heavyweight debut versus Chaz Witherspoon. Then he had that decision win versus Derek Chisora. And that was his most competitive and closest fight in the heavyweight division and he had those two emphatic victories over on Anthony Joshua in the first fight that's how he won the unified heavyweight titles and in his last fight he stopped Daniel Dubois and his win over on Chaz Witherspoon I think it was a technical decision not a TKO so pardon me and I had to correct that right quick. And Tyson Fury, if he's having exhibition bouts versus a former UFC heavyweight champion, 
And I think Francis Ngannou signed a lucrative deal with PFL, which is another MMA promotion that's not the UFC. And if he's having big money exhibition bouts for attraction reasons, then that goes to show y'all that he's ran out of options to fight. And that's why it only makes sense for this fight to happen. And it makes sense for the great year of 2023 that's been for the sport of boxing. And Tyson Fury did say, I read an article on ESPN about how Tyson Fury, who announced his retirement after defeating Der- was it Derek Chazor or Dillian White? It was after one of those fights where he announced retirement. And then a few months later, he unannounces his retirement. He did say after it was announced that this fight was made official, that he feels good and he wants to continue fighting for 10 years if he could. And that goes to show that Tyson Fury still feels like he's at the prime of his life and is in tip-top shape. And as for Alexander Usyk, who's the current majority heavyweight champion, this is the most challenging fight that he could have. And if you look at the tail of the tapes, I'm not only talking size-wise, I'm talking style-wise as well because Tyson Fury is a brilliant high ring iq fighter and is technically sound as well and he knows how to use his body mass and his height and reach advantage to his favor. And Alexander Usyk being technically sound and being a intelligent fighter as well makes him a dangerous opponent for Tyson Fury as well. And both fighters are undefeated and well-renowned. And all I can say as a avid boxing fan is I'm looking forward to this fight and that does it for this episode of Talk Boxing. Y'all let me know what y'all opinions are on all the subjects that I covered on this episode. Share, subscribe, like, comment, all that good stuff and show y'all support by clicking the links in the description and I'm out of here y'all. Peace.